I think this is a bad thing to change. Hello and welcome to the 24th episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series recounting Uganda's key political, economic and social milestones, and Bat Kakoza. In the previous episode, we focused on the brutal rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army of Joseph Coyne, its effect on Northern Uganda and how UPDF managed to defeat them. In this episode, we take a look at how Uganda made progress in growing the economy under the government's economic recovery program. Now, it's worth noting that by early 1990s, Uganda's economy had started picking up pace following the adoption of the liberal economic policies, aspects of which included liberalization of trade and opening up of the economy to private investment, liberalization of foreign exchange, and imposition of a strict physical discipline in managing government expenditure. Towards the end of 1980s, marketing coffee, which had been a preserve of the government through Coffee Marketing Board, had collapsed. Coffee, being the main export, uh, cotton had died, uh, coffee, co co uh, uh, copper production had died, so Uganda was exporting only coffee and a few other things like hides and skins. So it was the main focus. Main duty, and the coffee marketing board had the monopoly of buying all the coffee, processing it, and exporting it, and that was no mean job. So um, we used to use up all the money in the banks, and there were about three banks which were viable: uh, Greenlays Bank, Barclays, and UCB, which was. So we used to take up all the credit in the banks, and it was straining the eco economy. After 1986, the NRA made an attempt to butter coffee for the badly needed infrastructure rehabilitation, a move that was thwarted by global trends of trade. By the early 1990s, the bugolobi based silos was the only relic that remained symbolizing coffee marketing board. To get real value from coffee for the badly needed foreign exchange to inject into running the economy, government decided to pull out of the coffee sector by fully liberalizing coffee trade. World Bank and IMF to give Uganda loans and they came with conditions, one of which was to uh, abolish coffee marketing board and uh, start Uganda Coffee Development Authority there uh, under the Act of 19. 91 parliamentary act now to fund the economic recovery effort uganda launched an investment drive to attract direct foreign investment a key initiative that would revamp the economy uganda investment authority a semi-autonomous government agency was then set up in 1991 by an act of parliament to be at the forefront of the drive to develop a private sector-led economy and mandated to promote attract and retain foreign investment. With this mandate, the agency embarked on the task of sourcing investments through targeted marketing and promoting projects, including partnerships. We went from Austria, we went to Sweden, we went to Norway, we went to Denmark, we went to Italy, we went to the United Kingdom, we went to the United States. All that from May 1994 to the end of July 1994. So we visited these countries with Uganda and private sector investors, or would-be investors, who have projects that we take with us to these countries looking for technology, money, and partners, and markets. So that's the things we're doing for investors. To build confidence in potential investors, the investment code provided for return of expropriated departed Asian properties. All these measures were intended to encourage and fast-track foreign investment. In addition, the agency was tasked to provide information and advise government on appropriate policies for conducive investment promotion and growth. To have an agency 
uh, that had the, the, the expertise to identify the investment opportunities in Uganda. And uh, secondly, to facilitate the investors, make it easy to do business in our country, uh, both domestic and foreign, and uh, advocate for a better investment climate. With incentives like tax holidays, 100% foreign ownership of private investments and the free movement of capital to and from the country, Uganda was able to attract significant investment, more so in the manufacturing sector. In 1993, Parliament enacted the Public Enterprise Reform and Divestiture Legislation that subsequently became the PADS Act 1993 which became part of Uganda's economic recovery program that had been launched in the 1987. At the time, governments across the globe were divesting their interests in running businesses, a model that came to be known as privatization, and Uganda followed suit. The Privatization Act spelled out the country's privatization strategy, the implementation responsibility of which was placed within the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. The privatization strategy had four basic objectives. To reduce the direct role of government in the economy, to develop a correspondingly greater role for the private sector, to eliminate the continual financial burden that resulted from inefficiencies in running loss-making public enterprises, and to broaden share ownership among Ugandans. In total, there were 156 public enterprises, of which 133 were engaged in commerce, 20 lying dormant, and others incapacitated due to the widespread destruction stemming from previous political conflicts and financial mismanagement. They were characterized by low productivity, endemic losses, and huge indebtedness to government. They received subsidies amounting to 50% of public domestic revenue, despite contributing only a meager 10% to GDP, and they accounted for 18% of total bank credit. Someone will come from one of these companies and say, Mr. Minister of Finance, uh, we we'll lack some money here because, of, because we, we, don't have, we don't have enough salaries, enough funds for the people working there. You say, all right, give them this sort of thing. Through the peace, of course, we don't, ministers don't handle policy. Then after about another week or two, someone will come back. What I'm saying is this. They put there, once you put just civil servants because they are civil servants. All right? To, become a, to be a civil servant does not qualify you to become knowledgeable and capable in industry. For years, they had provided a safe haven for inept public officials, employed relatives of high-ranking government officials, and cash-rich individuals who faced the predatory action of politicians. They constituted an excessive administrative burden on public resources and needed to be offloaded. For government to free itself from these responsibilities and liabilities, privatization was inevitable. Government get out of production and trade. You concentrate on administration and security and whatever. Let the ordinary people, the private sector, do this. The various enterprises of government were graded so that we had a grade running from grade one to up to five. Five was the maximum. Those where government had to be in control, to remain in control, a hundred percent. Then grade number four, grade number three, where even you'd have a joint uh, public-private partnership arrangement, and then those which would have to be over period gradually sold off. And, uh, and completely done away with. Reviving these crippled industries through privatization was also driven by the need to address shortages of goods and services on the market. It was believed that a liberalized market would improve overall efficiency in productivity and offer consumers a choice from a varied range of goods and services at market prices. Matthew Ruchikere, then Minister in Charge of Privatization, underscored the benefits. Privatization is um, the idea of transferring uh, the ownership of these enterprises and their management from government to the private sector. Now, 
And the motive, reason for higher production, usually is the incentive that one has. When somebody is producing for himself, then obviously uh, the urge to produce is greater than when you are producing for somebody else. So it is a philosophical issue, and it is a global issue. There is a global movement now uh, which uh, believes that uh, production, it doesn't matter which country uh, you are talking about, is more effective when it is being carried out through the private sector than through uh, government-owned enterprises. By 1993, the process of divesting key manufacturing entities had started in earnest, and the changes in the management were already showing some promise. The Nile Breweries, I want to mention now uh, Hima and Tororo Cement, I want to mention Pepsi Cola, I want to mention even the Uganda Grain Meeting, I want to mention uh, Victoria Hotel. All of these, in the terms that I've explained, uh, employment, higher productivity, um, revenue to government, and so on, it is very clear that uh, they are producing a lot more uh, than they used to when they were still under government. Like Victoria Bottling Company, the holding Pepsi franchise was among the first companies to be privatized within the manufacturing sector. The new owners recapitalized the business, starting with the installation of a new bottling line with higher productivity capacity. Besides increasing production, the company was able to introduce new product brands and make them widely available to consumers across the country. We were able to invest uh, in the business who are able to, to grow the business, to bring, to expand. We need to bring more and more lines uh, to grow the business because the business was there, the market was there. In 1992, government divested itself from Nile Breweries under the privatization program by returning it to the Madvani Group. Nile Breweries Limited was a state enterprise since Idi Amin nationalized it following the expulsion of Asians in 1972. When we stepped into the brewery, it was in a very sad state. Uh, the government were running it, and they were producing around 30,000 cases a month. This was in 1992. It was amazing that they were producing beer. Um, nothing had been added to the brewery for some 20 years. So you can imagine Basically, the situation was quite pathetic. Um, what we had to do was really reconstruct and rebuild a substantial proportion of the brewery. It later changed hands to South African breweries, SAB Miller PLC, and by 2001, the brewery had transformed into a world-class operation. Today, the plant produces a total capacity of 1.8 million hectoliters of beer, in various brands and contributes a substantial amount to Uganda's tax revenue. The biggest advantage at that time was the, the government was attaining political stability. So what transpired was that we now had a, a more stable economy vis-a-vis -vis the political area. And as you know, when a businessman wants to invest in any country, he needs first to have political stability then he needs to have a market, and then he must have communication. Now, if governments provide these things, automatically the businessman will come. Located 230 kilometers along Kampala Malaba Road is Dororo Cement. Right from the time it was established by the government in 1952, the company was run by Uganda Development Corporation as a state enterprise. Like many industries that went through Uganda's turbulent times, it was in a state of collapse surviving on state subsidies and producing under installed capacity. At that time, the factory was in very bad conditions. With all the machineries, was run down and producing below 5% of the installed capacity. In 1995, Toro Cement was privatized and the new ownership took over the old plant machinery, and other infrastructure. The new management recapitalized the enterprise, installed new modern equipment, 
and machinery, which doubled production and turned it around to a profit-making venture. Capacity of the machineries is 10,000 tons per month. We are utilizing about 95% uh, production work for, uh, with workforce of 640 people. The relationship between the privatization initiative and the move to attract investment was beginning to garner the positive impact. The privatization worked. A lot of uh, private sector came in and took over a lot of the, the businesses that were government owned. We see the Ugandans come on board, start with small enterprises and grow and grow and grow and grow. To put additional impetus in the privatization process, government initiated the development of capital markets with the enactment of the Capital Markets Act and the establishment of the Capital Markets Authority in 1996. So once the law came into force, we were then able to go into partnership with the Capital Markets Authority so as to realize one of our objectives, that is to, to get public to participate, the public to participate in ownership through a transparent mechanism, which in this case and it would be the, with the capital markets uh, via the vehicle of the Uganda Securities Exchange. As a semi-autonomous body responsible for promoting, developing and regulating capital markets in Uganda, the regulatory authority made it possible for the second tier of companies to float on Uganda's stock exchange. The benchmark for listing was transparency and good corporate governance. The professionalization of the private sector companies. What I mean by this is that we want companies to transform into professional land corporates. Therefore, they'll need to embrace the good principles of corporate governance, transparency, accountability, integrity. They will need to restructure themselves in such a way that they can be able to access capital on the capital market. They will need to consider seriously, if they are family companies, the advantages of bringing in other outsiders to bring in expertise or to bring in capital. Uganda Clays Limited, a major construction material supplier, was reprivatized in 1999. Having also been a privately owned business nationalized by Idi Amin, it became one of first Uganda's companies to list on Uganda's stock exchange through initial public offerings. The opportunity gave Ugandans a chance to own 40% of the company through purchases of shares. With a new capital raised on Uganda Securities Exchange, Uganda Clays was able to revamp its production and marketing capacity. We have looked at three main things. The first one, we have looked at the production flow. We have put in very, very modern machinery. Also on production, we are putting up a new, very, very big kiln, a very modern Hoffman kiln which will be loaded and offloaded mechanically. At the moment, we have a of money killing by old fashioned. Then we have looked at the infrastructure, the administration of infrastructure and so on. We have doubled the office space, if you can see. The, we have now actually an entirely new office block. We have also looked at the aesthetic values of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the company. You can see there is a, the compound has been laid out, the approaches... Everything has been done very well to make sure that the public has a very good image of the company. Privatization of Uganda Commercial Bank, the largest bank in Uganda at the time, done amidst heavy public debate, was not only another opportunity for Ugandans to own a piece of a profitable business, but it freed badly needed government resources that could then be invested in public services. There was no day that that bank ever made profits, which then were, were, uh, profits were ploughed back to the benefit of either providing a road or providing a hospital or providing medicine or, provide, or building a school. Because every other year, for me, the period I was a minister of finance, that bank never made profit even a single financial year. To the contrary, we used to inject in money because Bank of Uganda would say there is a capital impairment and you cannot effectively be allowed 
to continue operating unless you inject in new capital so that the bank can effectively be operating. That is, that, that is one. Two, you had a problem of losing depositors' money itself that uh, the bank would be reflecting losses to a tune of about 20, 30 billion and so on and so forth. We had state banks that were a very huge drain on the, on the, on the, on the budget. We had huge non-performing loans. There was limited, limited financial intermediation, limited support to the private sector from, uh, from the banking system. In fact, outreach has increased during this period. We have uh, a greater support, bigger support of the financial system to, to, to the private sector. With growing momentum in private sector, other corporate entities followed suit and tailored themselves the requirements of public listing by cleaning up their books and issuing IPOs on the Uganda Securities Exchange. Years of political instability and economic decay in 1970s and 80s eroded Uganda's tax base and created gross inefficiencies in tax collection and administration. The Minister of Finance was then solely responsible for revenue collection through departments run by civil servants. Tax revenue had dwindled and was barely enough to run a country. And the tax collection was at its lowest. It was about, I think, 50 billion at the material time. And that was extremely low when you consider the budget to run a nation. When you had to pay tax, uh, to pay salaries, you have to meet other expenses of government. By 1991, Parliament made an assessment that led to the enactment of Uganda Revenue Authority Statute of 1991, which inadvertently set up the Uganda Revenue Authority, the URA. For eight years I had, I had been a member of Parliament. Uh, I was the chairman of the National Economic Committee, of the National Committee on the Economy. So we, we found it necessary and very, very important to have an institution which was, uh, uh, you know, separate from bureaucracy of the civil service. As a central body responsible for assessment and collection of revenue, it combined all the laws that were enforced then regarding tax collection. The new organization amalgamated three tax departments the Ministry of Finance, which included Customs and Excise, Inland Revenue, and Income Tax Departments. When we started, we had a revenue collection uh, shot, from, shot up from about 7 billion to more than double, almost 15, in one month alone. So by the time I left, it was after two terms. Our, our monthly revenue collection had gone over 70 billion. The semi-autonomous body was granted a degree of autonomy, although it remained under the supervision of the Minister of Finance. The primary critical task for URA at the time was to educate the public about the essence of paying taxes. So it was important that an institution is set up so that it can actually show the people that if you pay tax, you are not losing the money you, you had earned. You had a progressive grew both in capacity, efficiency in revenue collection, and widened the tax base to an extent that, by the mid-2000s, locally collected revenue was financing a substantial portion of the country's budget. For the last two financial years, uh, we have surpassed our target. With a surplus in both years, in 2004-2005 and 2005-2006. Now, we have managed to do that um, for two main reasons. One, we have built confidence in the public and therefore tax compliance from the taxpayers has risen. In the past, we had certainly low tax compliance and there was a lot of effort to raise that. But as long as the public did not feel you know, we, we are confident to give this body our money, they, they would keep our... By 2017, 
the tax body collection capacity had grown exponentially from a miserable 5 billion in 1986 to over 14 trillion in the financial year 2017-2018, accounting for 60% of the national budget financing. By 1996, the country had made substantial strides in attracting sound business investment. What was needed was to deepen investor confidence by putting in place mechanisms to guarantee that their finances invested in the country were secure. Another concern of the growing business community at the time was that courts at the time were not able to fully appreciate specialized commercial disputes or handle such cases in an efficient and expeditious manner. Uganda Commercial Court, a specialized commercial court to handle commercial disputes, was subsequently established as a division of the High Court. Now, with all the economic reforms and newly established supporting institutions in place, the economy had been reinforced with a dynamic takeoff and Uganda started experiencing a double-digit growth. In our next episode, we shall feature the making of Uganda's 1994 constitution, right from the Constitutional Review Commission to the actual promulgation of the new constitution. Thanks for watching and see you then. Le, 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 le,